A warm good evening to the erudite, ignited audience. This is Tasneem Akolawala, your MC for this evening. I begin with a gentle request for you to keep your cell phones on either switched off or silent mode. Welcome to VLF, arguably India's first and only non-fiction literary festival and the largest in Central Asia. We function online similar to other established literary festivals across the country, but with a difference that we have purely non-fiction authors here in action in Nagpur. Each year we have a different theme for the festival. This year's theme is non-fiction for nation. In line with this theme, we have various authors and topics that you will see until our annual extravaganza in Jan 2024. Most importantly, VLF focuses on increasing the tribe of non-fiction readers like you. Readers of a nation. The nation we take pride in. The nation which celebrates its diversity of culture, heritage and language in myriad ways. One such confluence of our nation emerges in writing. So here we are celebrating an author of our nation. I introduce the moderator of the event, Mr. Sachin Jahagirdar. Mr. Sachin is India Program Director for a US-based NGO, Share Our Strength. It is committed to provide midday meals to school children. He is our VLF General Secretary. Mr. Sachin is actively involved in various city growth organizations such as Vidar Management Association, Book Adda, and TEDx, to name a few. His keen interest in medieval history made him curate a program for history teachers called Curiosity Quotient, which has been successfully conducted by all leading schools in Nagpur. I would now like to introduce the author and focus, Mr. Weber Purandare. <laughs> Mr. Weber grew up in Mumbai in 1980s and 90s, the tumultuous decades in which Bala Sahib Thakre and Shiv Sena were most prominent. He began his journalistic career with the political magazine Blitz in 1993. Mr. Vaibhav has since worked with India's leading newspapers such as Indian Express, Asian Age, Daily News Analysis, that is Mumbai's DNA, Midday, Mumbai Mirror, apart from writing a host of publications and two very successful books other than Shivaji. Mr. Vaibhav is currently editor, Times of India, Mumbai. I request our moderator, Mr. Sachin Jahagirdar, to now escort the author for today's event, Mr. Vaibhav Purandare, to the dais. Please put your hands together so that we can begin Shivaji Saga thunderously. Thank you, Tasneem. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, it's very uh, happy to be part of the first uh, run-up event which will ultimately culminate into a festival in 2024. Uh, from here on, we'll have uh, monthly events like these uh, coming each month. Uh, at the end of the session, uh, we'll have uh, the reveal of monthly sessions as well as the date of the uh, festival. Uh, so way back in 2019, when I was attending a festival in Delhi, then I met first Webuff. There he was talking about then his bestseller on uh, Savarkar. And uh, there I met him first. And coincidentally, after our meeting, in next three months, VLF began its journey. That was the first uh, edition in 2020. There again, uh, we had the opportunity to uh, host uh, Weber for his book on Savarkar. So it's kind of uh, second appearance for Weber at VLF. So actually, welcome back, Weber. Thanks a lot, Sachin. Thank you for having me here. And uh, thank you to everybody here. Thank you to uh, VLF. Happy to be associated with VLF again. And thank you to everybody who's here because uh, I know it has been raining quite a bit in Nagpur. 
and still all of you have turned up so very happy also weber wasn't keeping well for last 3 4 days so thank you for making it here yes thanks thanks a lot sachin thanks uh so if you want to be part of vlf again you have got next 6 months to write one more book <laughs> before 24 so uh, coming to shivaji i mean uh, we all have read shivaji uh, possibly during school time for example uh, i was studying in uh, marathi uh, medium schools in uh, uh, maharashtra state boards so my introduction to shivaji maharaj as a personality happened uh, in my primary school and later after i graduated then i started reading various other authors other subjects uh, of course shivaji was uh, the central character i i'm sure we all have uh, read him at various stages of life uh but uh, vibe of my question is uh, for the last uh, hundreds of years there have been people writing about shivaji in various uh, ways various platforms uh, so what is this that inspired you to write about shivaji now apart from that this is the 350th year of his coronation or was it a pressure of your surname <laughs> that inspired <laughs> actually sachin i feel that uh, there hasn't been enough written about chatrapati shivaji really so i have a very different opinion from yours you feel there have been lots of books written about him but i feel not enough has been written about him and if we look beyond maharashtra uh, at the all india picture then shivaji has suffered an enormous amount of neglect nationally when it comes to history writing when it comes to discussing historical legacy and when it comes to discussing a historical personality's impact on the past the present and the future now here is a man an individual who took on an empire imagine an individual taking on an empire empire it's a hopeless situation you will not give him even half a chance especially if the empire is one of the world's greatest and when i mean greatest i mean in terms of size when it's one of the biggest in the world you will certainly not give him even half a chance and under mughal emperor aurangzeb the mughal empire covered one fifth of the world's known land surface during the 17th century amazing and it is during such a period that from one corner of the deccan shivaji raja bhosle emerges and poses a great challenge to this gigantic empire and shakes it to its foundations and sows the seeds of its eventual fall and disc and destruction not only does he do that he builds his own independent state he fashions policies for responsible and responsive conduct in public life he implements policies for the benefit of and welfare of the people of the common people of the region and outside the region as well and he changes the entire political map of not only the deccan but of the entire subcontinent after he founds his own independent state the marathas expand to a point where they rule from attack which is now in pakistan to bengal in the east ha huh. so in bengal in fact it is raguji bhosle from nagpur who goes all the way to bengal to rule there and in the 18th century the century truly belongs to the marathas in india and if you look at the map of india in the 18th century it's maratha rule all over the country now have we studied the origin of this rule adequately enough do we discuss it adequately enough in the discovery of india pandit nehru i love him as a writer he is a wonderful writer he writes one paragraph on shivaji and the marathas i agree which i sad. feel is completely inadequate very sad considering the impact that shivaji has had because shivaji's impact is not related to his, only his lifetime his lifetime of course is important but the post shivaji period is equally important because it is his his inspiration that the marathas carry when they 
take their rule beyond the frontiers of the deccan to the north to the east and further down to the south and during the independence movement it is figures like lokmanya tilak uh, rabindranath tagore aurobindo ghosh who write poems uh, aurobindo wrote such a lovely poem on baji prabhu deshpande rabindranath wrote a poem on uh, chatrapati shivaji himself and an entire generation drew inspiration from the personality of shivaji maharaj to take on the british so he and his template for governance is still considered the template to follow in the 21st century now if a person has so much of a legacy why haven't we discussed him enough when we discuss aurangzeb and others endlessly i am not for a moment saying that the moguls should not be discussed i am saying everybody should be discussed but we haven't discussed shivaji adequately enough and that is one of the reasons i started reading writing this book so i get your point but uh, another thing that comes to my mind when i got my hands on this book uh, the book is titled as a biography yeah so uh, there are a lot of fancy uh, people who write you know leadership skills management skills of shivaji maharaj and current relevant uh, uh, skills today in management in business so why do you chose uh, why did you choose biography as your title of the book i'll give you the reason for that uh, the reason i chose to write a biography is that we have ourselves read a number of biographies of chatrapati shivaji in english the two defining biographies for us have been one by dennis kincaid who was a british official and second by jadunat sarkar who was a historian yes now both these biographies were written over 100 years ago and there is a lot of outdated material there's a lot of misleading and wrong material in these books and it is important that we take note of the discoveries that have happened in the last century or so and update stuff revise stuff in such a manner <clears throat> as to present the real truth of history and also to correct misconceptions and myths and falsities and falsehoods that may have crept in another reason is that while jadunath sarkar had a heavy dependence on persian sources for shivaji's biography that he wrote and while dennis kincaid depended heavily on james grant duff's original history of the marathas in three volumes mm -hmm. which he wrote in the early part of the 19th century right they completely disregarded some very critical marathi sources especially the contemporary sources related to shivaji's life then there are two contemporary sources related to shivaji's life which we need to look at very very closely one is parmanand who was an eye witness to what happened during chatrapati shivaji's lifetime parmanand was an associate of chatrapati shivaji and he often traveled with shivaji on his campaigns so he has given eye witness accounts of various battles he has given interesting details like on a particular battlefield where exactly was shivaji raje what was he wearing where was his sword what was the kind of ammunition he was carrying what horse was he sitting on now these are very interesting and fascinating details that he has missed out on similarly krishna ji anant sabhasad who wrote the sabhasad chronicle you refer sabhasad in yes i have referenced both of them have uh, you know so both parmanand and sabhasad have given some very interesting details which have been inaccessible to us thanks to jadunath sarkar and thanks to kincaid and jadunath sarkar in fact unfairly dismisses a number of things that they say just because he can't read marathi and he is relying entirely on the persian sources and i feel that these two accounts need to be taken very seriously of course you have to check those accounts you have to check corroborative evidence you can't blindly just swallow what they are saying but it is very important when contemporaries are writing and eye witnesses are writing about history you need to take note of that similarly we haven't paid enough attention to foreign accounts of chatrapati shivaji That's so right. we have not paid enough attention to what the british have written about shivaji what the french in pondicherry wrote about shivaji what the portuguese on the western coast wrote about shivaji what the dutch wrote about shivaji so all of that is also very interesting because just to give you an example 
when we talk about Chhatrapati Shivaji's coronation in 1674, now if we look at all the Marathi stuff that's written, we have Gaga Bhatt's mantras. Now you will find entire books about the mantras that Gaga Bhatt read during the ceremony. But it is the British officials who were present there who have given us the exact details about where exactly Shivaji Maharaj was sitting, where was Sambhaji sitting, who was sitting next to him, who was behind, what was the design of the place like. And very little details about the ceremony, how Chhatrapati Shivaji sat on the back of an elephant and went around Raigad Fort and uh, waved to people and spoke to people. Very little mundane details of everyday life that are extremely important and that we as Indians have historically unfortunately disregarded. We have not written about these details. So I wanted to do full justice to Shivaji's story by portraying the Shivaji of history and also by differentiating between legend and myth. So when I picked up this book, uh, पहले मुझे ऐसा लगा कि यार शिवाजी के बारे में स्कूल से पढ़ते आ रहा हूँ तो अगर हम शिवाजी की बात करें तो कुछ चीज़ें ना बड़ी सिनोने में से जैसे फॉर एग्जांपल शाहिस्ता खान या अफजल खान या फिर द ग्रेट स्केप ऑफ कोर्स फ्रॉम आगरा सूरत लूट लिया वो वाला एपिसोड तो मैंने कहा यार ये सारे एपिसोड्स तो पढ़े हुए और क्या मिलने वाला है इस किताब के अंदर में सो जस्ट टू गिव यू अ ग्लिम्स वॉट वॉट लाइज इन द बुक इज वी आर टॉकिंग अबाउट बायोग्राफीज सो द फर्स्ट बायोग्राफी इन उर्दू was written way back in 1896 and coincidentally that year is uh, uh, coinciding with Tilak's Shivaji movement in Maharashtra. So can you guess who wrote that Urdu biography 1896? He was a freedom fighter to give you a clue. Another clue is because it's an Urdu, so he was a North Indian freedom fighter. Any guess? It's by, should I, it's by Lala Lajpat Rai. Lala Lajpat Rai. So, these are the finer details you will find in this book. Uh, and uh, even if you know a lot of episodes, but this book will still give you some uh, revelations and uh, it will be a fantastic read. And by any chance, if you're thinking that I'm actually selling the book, you're actually right. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I was afraid you will say no. <laughs> uh, so one word that I... Uh, learnt while I was reading the book, uh, he mentions a word called uh, apocryphal story. So apoc apocryphal story means the stories that uh, we thought are true, we believe to be true. Yeah, we legends, maybe. Legends, legends. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So certain legends, just say for example, I really had a shock, tha, not uh, with this book, but, but before the book I realized, in Marathi, there's a story in Marathi, Gad Alapan Siha Gela. Have you heard this? So, my school textbook had this, Gadala Pan Siha Gela. And now I realize that it wasn't said by Shivaji. In fact, it was picked up from a Marathi play. And it was never said by Shivaji Maharaj. Similarly, there are stories around uh, Bhavani's, uh, Shivaji's Talwar, Bhavani. Some goddess came into his dreams. Then there's a story about uh, Ramda Swami. Um, I am told by Vaibhav over the discussion that uh, there are no proofs that Shivaji Maharaj actually met Ramda Swami. So, uh, and you also talk about A.R. Antule in your book, Rick, when you talk about Bhavani Talwar. Uh, and by the way, those fans of Jadunath Sarkar, uh, please read the book. There's one paragraph where he has contradicted Jadunath Sarkar uh, at one uh, place. So, what is your thought on apocryphal stories as such, which are surround Shivaji Maharaj or any personality of that stature? How should we take it? Should we take it with a pinch of salt? Should we really blindly believe or we should take the spirit out of it? Or in fact, that very popular story of uh, Kalyan Subeda's uh, daughter-in-law who was you know, sent back. So what's your take on all these stories? No, I will, uh, I will uh, talk about these two incidents that you have mentioned and then I will explain what my stand is. Because first people need to know what it's all about. We, we all know the Sivagat story. I don't need to tell the audience in Nagpur here what it means. <laughs> So we have all learnt that Shivaji Maharaj said Gad Alapan Siva Gela and that is how Kondana was renamed as Siva Gad. Now that is a basic fallacy because Kondana's other name was always Siha Gad. There is a letter of Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj himself dated 1663. Tanaji dies in the year 1670, we know that, right? After Shivaji Maharaj comes back from Agra in 66-67, uh, 
Tanaji dies in 1670 when he is capturing, recapturing Reca Kondhana. Recapturing Kondhana. But Kondhana's other name is Sinhagad and the letter of 1663 of Chhatrapati Shivaji himself mentions that Kondhana is Sinhagad. Very interesting. So it was always known as that. And because it was known as Sihagad, you know, obviously the quote is attributed to Shivaji as saying Gad ala pan Siva gela. Why did he not say Gad ala pan maza vag gela? Uh -huh. uh, he could have used any other metaphor. But because the Gad is Siva Gad, he is saying it's, you know, Siva gela. Yes, got it. So this is, these are things that, that we have never been told about. It's not true. So if somebody tells you, oh, you know, do you know why Sihagad is named after that? You know, that is what. No, so please tell him that no, you can. They can actually read this book or buy it, as Sachin said. <laughs> the other example is of the Kalyan Subedar. Yes. Hmm. Now that story actually exists in one of the latter day chronicles. Now there are lots of bakhars in Marathi, which are eight. 19th century documents. Now this Kalyan Subedar story is not in any of the contemporary accounts. It's not in Parmanand, it's not in Sabhasad, it's not in the Bijapur accounts. Though apparently the Kalyan Subedar's daughter-in-law was sent back to Bijapur with full honours by Chhatrapati Shivaji. So Bijapur documents don't have it. The Mughal documents don't have it. The Portuguese who record each and every little thing and the British who record everything practically, they don't have it. It is sometime in the 19th century that there is a chronicle called the Chitnis Bakar, which is also known as, uh, there is a Chitnis Bakar and there is another Bakar which is known as the Ekendav Kalmi Bakar. That is known as Ekendav Kalmi because it doesn't have a name, but it has 91 columns, the column. So that is why it's called as the Ekendav Kalmi Bakar. So, most of the material in that Bakar has been drawn from Sabasa's chronicle and a lot of stories which are simply hearsay have been added to that uh, Sabasa's story. So, this is one more story which has been added to the Ikendo uh, Kalmi Bakar. And that Bakar itself has 7-8 versions. So, in those 7-8 versions also, it's not uniformly in all the versions. It's only in one of the versions, which is known as the Sane version. That is the only place where this story occurs. And after it, this stuff was written in the Ekendo Kalmi Bakar, it was written in the Chittis Bakar, which copied a lot of the stuff that was in the Ekendo Kalmi Bakar. Ekendo Kalmi Bakar was around 1808 or 1810 it was written. Then 1885, 1884 is when Chitnis Chronicle is written and that is when they have gusa out basically the story of this Kalyan Subedaraji Sun. And imagine, you know, a dialogue like if my mother had been so beautiful, I would have also turned so handsome, you know. I mean, it's unlikely that somebody like Shivaji is going to say it. But we believed it. We believed it because unfortunately a lot of Shahirs and a lot of people started spreading the story. See, these stories are very colourful. And they are symbolic in a sense. So, this is where I will give my take on what these legends are. See, legends cannot be totally disregarded. Legends tell you a lot. Legends are symbolic. They tell you, Tanaji's legend in fact tells you the, of the closeness and the bond between Shivaji and Tanaji. Even if it, a lot of it is invented. It's also sends so, a good message. Sends you a message. So, what legends tell you is the legends tell you about the cultural memory of an entire people, of an entire community, how they relate to history, how they cite these examples from history. So often legends matter more, count more than the facts themselves. Yes, actually, I agree. So they should not be totally disregarded. True. But at the same time, we should be clear that this is legend and this is the fact. History. That's and right. there is a difference. For example, all of us have read about the French Revolution. All of us have read that the famous, the most famous line about the French Revolution is, if you don't have bread, eat cake. This is a completely invented line. <laughs> it is complete myth. Mary Antoinette never, never uttered that line. And every historian that you will ask about the French Revolution or read will tell you that it's a lie. This line was never uttered. But we associate, all of us associate, this line with the French Revolution. 
Mm. So myths have their own place in society. True. But I am not writing about myths. I am making a differentiation without disregarding myths. But I am telling you that this is a myth. Look at it as a myth. Perfect. Sounds good. Uh, How many of you have uh, watched this uh, Bollywood uh, flick called uh, Tanaji? See the popularity. <laughs> he refers to that. Uh, but he's coined a term which is called Band of Brothers. So uh, when he says Band of Brothers, uh, the, the, he talks about three uh, very able uh, generals and soldiers of uh, Shivaji's uh, team. And one of them is Tanaji Malusare, of course. But two more uh, that he has put them in the same basket with the band of brothers. Uh, one is called Yesaji, another is called Baji. Now, until I read this book, for me, Baji was Baji Prabhu Deshpande. It's synonymous that Baji. The Purandara is synonymous with Shivaji. <laughs> so, Baji, for me, it was like Baji Prabhu Deshpande. There was too much pressure on me to write this book. <laughs> <laughs> so, I want to you know, uh, know from you that what is the importance of these other two characters? I mean, we never heard, we never. I, any of you have heard these names, Yesaji and Baji? And what's the surname? Yes, uh, they would have, I mean, some of them would have heard because yes, in but Marathi. You don't know the importance, whether you put no, them in the same no, basket. I, I will talk about the importance. Then these two people are Yesaji Kank, uh, we, you, have, you would have read about them, and Baji Pasalkar. So the, why they are important is that they are among his earliest associates and closest associates. Because see, these are very early years. Shivaji is managing his father's Jagir in and around Pune and he's going around in the valleys, he's familiarizing himself with the hills and with the region and he forms this very close bond with some of the young men there uh, who are you know around his same age. So Yesaji Kank is around his same age but Baji Pasalkar is not his age. Baji Pasalkar is much elder to him but he joins him realizing that this boy is up to something and at the age of 16 Chhatrapati Shivaji, we know, does something very special. One of his earliest letters is at the age of 16. And that is when he gets a complaint of sexual assault from an ordinary village woman saying that the Patil of Ranja has violated her and uh, what can be done about it. Now, Patils are the revenue collectors. They also have policing responsibilities in a village. And the Deshmukhs are revenue collectors at the district and sub-district level. And they are also the revenue collectors, you know, broadly. Strong so, men. Yeah. So uh, when he gets this complaint, the established order is such that the woman can't do anything. There, what recourse to justice can she have? Because if she goes to the Jagirdar's son, Jagirdar, by the way, yeah. All these people were, you know, <laughs> Jagirdar and Purandare and, uh, talking about Shivaji. <laughs> correct, correct, correct. Uh. So, what do you do? There is no recourse to justice. It's an just, it's an unjust and oppressive system. Jagirdars are ruling all over the place, but Sachin is not among them, by the way. He's a good man, as well. But. This young man at the age of 16 takes it very seriously. He investigates the complaint and when he finds out that it is true, he calls the Patil and ha we know he has his hands and legs chopped off. And that sends a certain message in the entire region because people are not used to this kind of justice and this kind of true. accountability. Right. And suddenly they see who is this person and he's only 16 years old. Mm. And they start seeing hope for themselves. They start seeing hope for their families. They suddenly start seeing a future for themselves. And that is the beginning of the revolution. We are often taught that the taking of Torna and mm. the taking of the oath in the te uh, temple is the beginning of the revolution. By the way, the taking of the oath never happened. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. That is another legend. Uh, th there is a fraudulent document that was created by a particular family in the Deccan to establish its claim over a property. There was a property dispute happening sometime in the 19th century, late 19th century. And this, and one side of the family, which was pressing its claim on the property, wanted to establish that somehow it has been associated with 
Chhatrapati Shivaji's family and with, Chhatrap with the Chhatrapati himself right from the beginning. So they produced this fraudulent letter say, talking about the oath taking and how all these people were present at the oath taking where they goose out the name of their own family member, their own ancestor. So this oath taking never happened. Very interesting. That is symbolic again. And that document has been established by every historian. I'm not the first person to establish it as a fraudulent document. Uh, from G. H. Khare, you know, the famous historian G. H. Khare, uh, to Mehendare, to many people, G. H., uh, you know, Gajanand Bhaskar, Mehendare, to others have established that this is a fraudulent document. This is not genuine. So the if if somebody asks you what is the beginning, it is actually the letter, and I have reproduced that letter which Chhatrapati Shivaji has written at the age of 16 in my book, which is giving the order to cut off the hands and legs of the Patil of Ranja so village at, at that point, because a woman's honor has been violated. So at this point, uh, the, the two other brand of brothers were with him? With him, yes, with him, okay. were with him. So, that's so that is the beginning of the political revolution because it sends a certain message. Got it. Uh, and there is another very important thing he does at the age of 16. Sorry, Sachin, I'll just mention one more thing here. Uh, he, she, there, were, there were royal seals at the time and everybody issued royal seals in Persian at the time because that was the Persianate age. And after Alauddin Khilji's invasion of the Deccan in 1296, Sanskrit and the Devanagari language was replaced in official documents by Persian. Now, Marathi documents and Devanagari documents were also issued, but that is for a villager to understand. But for official document was always in Persian with the chapa in Persian. The official sign was in Persian. So, Shahji Raja's own royal seal is in Persian. Jizabai's own seal is in Persian. Dadaji Kondev's seal is in Persian. Chhatrapati Shivaji decides at the age of 16 that my seal is going to be in Sanskrit. Wow. Well, that is a major Super. statement he makes at the age of 16 himself. That is a major departure from what is happening in the Deccan. Even the minor Rajas of the South, there are very small minor Rajas in the South, like Pratap, Rudra and others, further down South, not in Maharashtra, but later, further in the Deccan, who call themselves Sultan and who yes. call, who, who, had their royal signage in Persian. But Chhatrapati Shivaji at the age of 16, he designs his seal in Sanskrit. He makes a deliberate departure. He does that. And while everybody is crowning themselves as Sultan and calling themselves Sultan, in 1674 when he crowns himself as a, he crowns himself not as a Sultan, but as the Chhatrapati. So right. he has Hindu ideals of kingship that he associates himself with. Though he is tolerant and respectful of all religions, I have including a question, Islam. I have a question around that, so we will come to that later. But uh, So those who watched uh, this movie, Tanaji, uh, with your raise of hand, did you watch the another film called uh, Bajirao Mastani? Yes. So, so uh, I avoided the plague. <laughs> so very interesting, one chapter in his book uh, opens up with young 20-year-old uh, boy who visits uh, Shivaji at uh, Raigad and he expresses his uh, desire to join Shivaji. Uh, and I realized that possibly he is the only man who has met Shivaji and later he has also met Bajirao Peshwa. There is quite a big difference between the two uh, eras. So can you guess who is this man? Spot on. Chhatrasal, Mastani's father. So Chhatrasal uh, meets uh, Shivaji uh, uh, when he was 20, barely, in Raigad. Uh, so my, uh, what I am driving to you is, uh, there are there were very, f uh, in about say, a span of about 5-6 years, in quick succession, there were very remarkable developments happened. For example, uh, Surat, loot of Surat in 1665, uh, I guess. 1664. 64. 64. 65 and 66 is that uh, treaty, Purandar Treaty, 65. 66 is the great escape from Agra. And then 74 is, uh, no, so, sorry, 70 again Surat is looted. And 74 is uh, the coronation. So these very remarkable things happened in about 5-10 years, quick succession. Uh, and then you have this Bundela youngster who 
uh, reaches out to Shivaji and expresses his desire to join hands. Also, after the great escape from Agra, uh, the questions are raised about the uh, uh, their uh, li uh, intimacy with uh, uh, Aurangzeb. Uh, the man involved is Raja Jai Singh and his son. Uh, they are also alleged that you know they kind of let him uh, run away, and some stringent actions was taken against uh, uh, Mirza Raja's son. And later, I think some Rajputs also, in their heart, they always loved Shivaji as and his uh, adventures. So, uh, do you really believe that this, uh, I mean, also draw, drawing your attention to now the coronation part and its importance. So, do you think that this coronation was also important vis-a-vis -vis his great escape from Agra and the period between that which led to people like uh, Chhatrasal to reach out to him or Raja Jai Singh, we know had a soft corner for Shivaji somewhere in his heart, you know, uh, we have read about it. Uh, Ram Singh was also in question. So the Rajputs, maybe the Bundelas and also the some Sikh Sardars. So, and they were quite a big in numbers of Aurangzeb's court. Mm -hmm. So over the years during the coronation, did they started kind of gather some sympathy for Shivaji and express their desire to join hands or they were appreciative of him? Is there any uh, record which says that yes, they had sympathy for uh, Shivaji, the, these type of tribes? Okay, Chhatrasal's story is interesting because Chhatrasal's story indicates the kind of star status that Shivaji had acquired even before uh, his coronation. Mm -hmm. And uh, especially after his escape, dramatic escape yes. from Agra. So Chhatras Chhatrasal's parents, Chhatrasal is from Bundelkhand. And his parents were actually killed by Aurangzeb. Oh. Yeah. And uh, he joined but he's still with Aurangzeb's Jesse. army as a soldier. Well, at that time, most people joined one or the army or the other. And you have too many examples from the time of the Mahabharata himself, itself of, uh, you know, people being killed and the children joining the same force and all that, you know. So even uh, even Krishna, you know, uh, now Jarasandha, he ki, Jarasandha is killed, but Jarasandha's son is installed uh, as, yes. as the ruler by Krishna himself mm -hmm. and he supports Krishna. So that has been happening from the time of the Mahabharata itself. Yes. No, no, interestingly, uh, I just want to bring to the notice of the audience that Chhatrasal actually fought against Shivaji when he was on the side of Raja Jai Singh. Yeah. yeah. And later yeah. he expresses a desire. I mean, that's the Correct. change. So the huh. change happened because of what? Yeah. The so what what happened? There were a, uh, there were a variety of factors. One was that uh, a news spread after a series of incidents about the work and actions and achievements of Shivaji Raji. So one was the killing of Afzal Khan. Yes. The second was the dramatic nocturnal attack on Shaiste Khan. After which people started thinking that he has some, he, you know, he's some magician who suddenly appears and disappears uh, and he has some special powers. And then the escape from Agra took his popularity to the next level, a new high mm. and his fame spread across India. So Chhatrasal who had fought against him as a teenager, yes. as part of Jai Singh's army. One fine day in 1670, he leaves the, the Mughal camp on one pretext on the other. He actually escapes from there okay. and he reaches Shivaji's camp and says he wants to meet Shivaji. Shivaji welcomes him and asks him why he has come to meet him. He says that, you know, I want to join your army because you are doing such great work. And what Chhatrapati Shivaji tells him is remarkable. Now, because that is an indication of the kind of political vision that the man has. He says, if you join my army and you become successful, the credit will be mine, mm -hmm. not yours. So you go to your homeland, Bundelkhand, and establish your own Raj there. Interesting. Establish your own state there, give justice to your people there, fight Aurangzeb and the Mughals there. The political climate at the time also we have to understand to answer your question. Why have more and more Rajputs and Bundelas started gravitating towards Chhatrapati Shivaji? Because 
the big momentous clash between Shivaji and Aurangzeb is in full flow, flow now. Hmm. And Aurangzeb has become more and more intolerant as the days go by. In 1669, he has, you know, and 1670, he demolishes Kashi and Mathura, the big temples which are extremely holy for the Hindus. In the 1660s, early 1660s itself, he imposes certain customs. Uh, is our time already over? Okay. Uh, we are still at 1670. Ten more years to go at least. So, Where was I at? At the temples. So, in the 1660s, he imposes certain customs duties which have to be paid only by the Hindus. Right. So, if you are a Hindu, you have to pay them. If you are a Muslim, you, you don't have to pay them. Then he imposes the jazia tax, yes. which explicitly says that because you are a kafir, you have to pay that tax. So, there is a lot of intolerance happening and there is a lo lot of intolerance happening against communities which are in the north, against the Sikhs against the Rajputs, against the Bundelas. So everybody is upset and everybody realizes that the Marathas led by this dynamic young leader, Chhatrapati Shivaji, because Shivaji is hardly 36 when he escapes from Agra and he is only 14, 1670. So that yes. he becomes a tremendous attraction after the dramatic decade. See the decade from 1656 to 1666 is hugely dramatic because that is when all the action happens. From Afzal Khan to Shaiste Khan to Jai Singh to Agra. So all the action happens around that time. You know? And then he has become this superstar. That is why they gravitate towards him and they realize that this man is very clear about certain things. He respects Islam. He does not have disrespect for other religions. Because Khafi Khan has written in his uh, official accounts and in, even in Masire Alamgiri and other uh, accounts, which are official accounts of Aurangzeb's rule, it has been written that uh, Shivaji respected the Quran and whenever he had given explicit orders to his generals and soldiers that if they found a copy of the Islamic holy book, they should respectfully return it to its owner. Or if they found women and children of the enemy in any fort or place or region that they had captured, they must be respectfully returned to their homes or to the capital of the region which you have cap captured. So there is no disrespect for holy men of various faiths, whether it is a fakir or anybody else it may be, even a Catholic priest, because during the raid of Surat, there is an account left behind by the British and the yes. Portuguese that he keeps actually a ring of his own soldiers around the French Capuchin church there and gives orders to his uh, people not to molest anybody inside. Uh, here molest means I am not trouble anybody inside and because there are priests there who are doing good work there. So he respects holy people of different faiths, he respects the holy texts of different faiths, he respects women and children. From At the age of 16 itself he has made it clear that he will not tolerate any instances of sexual assault even if they are made by people who are part of his own region or part of his own army, even when he goes to Golconda, you know, during his southern campaign after mm. coronation and he finds out that one of his soldiers has sexually assaulted a woman, he immediately uh, gives him capital punishment there. Oh. Yes, yes. There is an instance that is in the records there. So, on the one side is his public character and personal character and integrity and honesty, honesty of intent, honesty of purpose and honesty of action. And on the other hand, he is very clear that he will not allow his whole cultural, religious and civilizational identity to be wiped out by anybody. He will assert his own cultural identity. So he will assert the, the, that Sanskrit is my language, that Hinduism is my religion. I will carry out the coronation according to Hindu norms and rituals of kingship, but I will not disrespect other religions. So his idea of Hinduness is also underpinned, underpinned by the Hindu values of tolerance and inclusivity. And that is why he, he finds himself, you know, uh, I mean, that is why people find him 
irresistible. Uh, 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 last section of the Hindus start finding him irresistible. So that's why this they started drawing the yes. sympathy. Uh, so, uh, so the in fact, uh, if I may mention one thing, you know, there is a Marathi writer called uh, Bhalchandra Nemade who the other day said that uh, uh, you know. Uh, said that, uh, oh, Aurangzeb was, you know, he, he was not intolerant and all that. What rubbish this Nebadi talks uh, about. You tweeted you about know, it. I um, remember, yes. yes. Uh, he, you know, yes. he, he re reads, he writes fiction, he should stick to fiction, you know. He nobody should. knows him, by the way. Ha. Ha, nobody, I mean, it's nobody good that knows nobody him. knows him, Let's but you know, we think also. that nobody knows him, but I <laughs> so know, people know, a lot him? of people have told me why I'm, why I give yes. importance. Yes. But you know, actually, uh, Especially in the Marathi media, there is some sort of disease about these people, you know. They rate these people very highly. And uh, I, I want to talk about it because there is no point in keeping quiet. Otherwise, this becomes ah. a reality, you know, mm. if you keep quiet. What rubbish is he talking about? That Aurangzeb was uh, tolerant and uh, uh, he uh, destroyed the Kashi and uh, Mathura temples because two of his women were molested. First of all, there is absolutely zero evidence that any such thing happened there. And Second is, Bhalchandra Nebadi should tell me one thing. In 1640s, Aurangzeb was the governor of the Deccan when he was a prince. Right. And he, when he was in Gujarat, he has issued orders that all the temples in a region called Chintaman in uh, Gujarat should be destroyed. Now, which women were attacked in, uh, which Mughal women were attacked in Chintaman in Gujarat in the 1640s for him to demolish those temples? So, uh, people should talk, stop talking rubbish and stick yes. to the facts and if they don't know, they should shut up. I and uh, Salman Rushdie actually once told Nemade that he should shut up. <laughs> huh? And I used to believe that Salman Rushdie was unfortunately rude to Nemade, but now I believe that he was saying the right thing. Now you became rude to him. <laughs> So uh, I love his Kosla, by the way. It's a lovely novel, but fiction is what you should stick to. Is mm. uh, so I, that draws me to another point. Uh, I have uh, also read in your book uh, at various places, and I have told you over. I have marked those page numbers also when I was talking to him over phone. Uh, there is one unfortunate uh, uh, adjective which is attached with Shivaji Maharaj. Not only the Indian historians, but the uh, Europeans especially. They also have attached this uh, adjective to Shivaji and that adjective is rebel. Now we are talking about a king who has done his coronation and then there are certain historians uh, who call him a rebel. So uh, why people call him a rebel? But Sachin, I don't consider rebel to be a bad word. Not really? Rebel is a good word. No, that… No, rebel… Uh, See, it depends on how you are looking at it. Exactly. A rebellion, against, I I rebellion, a rebellion against an oppressive system, an unjust system is good rebellion. That's what right. were the uh, what were what were the freedom fighters doing? They were rebelling against the I British agree. Raj. Yes. So, so Shivaji Maharaj was not only rebelling against the Adil Shahi of Bijapur. He was not only rebelling against the Mughal Raj. He was rebelling against the system. He was Which rebelling was against uh, an oppressive, unjust system. So, it, in if that, he, context if it that makes him a rebel, Doesn't matter. Uh, it's, a, it's a compliment. <laughs> I would take it as a compliment. Got and he, he is indeed fundamentally a rebel because that is what people who fight against any sort of injustice are. I mean, they are rebels. So, of course, he coronated himself and he became a king. The coronation itself was extremely significant mm. because and that is again there you, there you see his uh, foresight that why you need to get yourself coronated is because you, the state that you are establishing the system that you are establishing must have some sort of legitimacy and legality now if i am imposing a system of administration in a particular place say in nagpur i am establishing a system of administration and i am saying okay this is the system of taxes people need to pay so much as tax they need to give so much to the state so much they can keep for themselves and this is what i will give to the state uh, to the people this is what the people need to give to the administration now where is the legal stamp for it any ordinary citizen can get up and tell me that who are you to impose this system? You are a rebel against Bijapur. You are a rebel against the Mughal Raj. But what is your legal status? 
how are you the government so to order to make it in order to make it very clear that you are the government you are the system and you have the legal system of governance of government of uh, framing laws and policies and implementing those policies unless you coronate yourself correct you do not acquire that legality and how that legality again helps to give shape to the future is that it helps his successors to build the maratha state even further and make it bigger so that it goes all the way from atak to katak uh, tasneem is giving me very stern looks from there so uh, i know we are running out of time and my, my questions are still not over uh, but i'll have my last question uh, to him which is nothing to do with shivaji as such but yes there is a, a link to that and then i'll open this uh, for your questions and queries uh my question to you that's in your personal capacity uh vibe of so people here uh, will agree that uh, we in nagpur uh when it comes to wildlife tourism or any other tourism which is motorable we serve and we give uh, you know kind of business to madhya pradesh tourism which is motorable for us you know, in the radius of about 300 kilometers 400 kilometers my pain point is that the mtdc has never done enough to attract the maharashtrians to their tourism now for example shivaji is such sellable object and his forts i always say that his forts are not palaces they are strategic forts they have got fantastic locations to look up to whether the sea forts or any other fort they have there is a strategy behind it but we as a state of maharashtra uh, have never done enough to attract people take a corridor of forts or anything uh, except for building maybe a rope way to raigarh or something else but we haven't done enough now my question to you in your capacity personal capacity is that you're not a common man vai bhav you are first of all you're a Just journalist because my surname is purandar and i'm associated with this <laughs> i'll tell you why you are a journalist you're a journalist with times of india you are sitting in mumbai you are very close to the administrators the policy makers who are in mumbai you have got access to them uh, you are an influential uh, writer this is i think your fifth sixth book fifth yes fifth book uh, you have been writing about it so my question to you is have you as a journalist or in your personal capacity have you done enough to talk about these things you had a tourism minister you was very near to you uh, so have you done enough to talk about this corridors of forts or anything to do with shivaji as a tourism to attract people you know to take tours and understand the clearly the state of the forts today shows that i am not influential enough <laughs> <laughs> they don't listen to you uh, but uh, i must tell you that i am in fact uh, doing something in collaboration with somebody there are certain ideas that we are trying to implement we are also trying to tell the state government which is open to ideas but those ideas have to be implemented and unfortunately successive governments have not done enough except for declaring that we are giving so many crores for the restoration of this that i believe that we need to get a little innovative when it comes to protecting preserving promoting and restoring our heritage and there are certain ideas i have which i am discussing now uh, with the policy makers hopefully let's hope that they will be implemented if they consider them to be good enough what i would like to say here is that no doubt the forts are very important but we need to get a little innovative in our approach because maratha forts like we all know are not like the forts of rajasthan not the they are not uh, very very palace like forts they are functional forts right. they were basically built for battles True. and they were not uh, built to live a very leisurely and kingly life you know because that was not the idea in the deccan at all it was only after the peshwas went to the north that they realized that oh my god houses are so big here and that is why they came came back and built the shaniwar wada which was so big so it's a fact i mean in, in fact nana saheb's letters and others let other letters make mention of the places in north india and they say oh my god you know we didn't know houses could be so big and forts could be so big let's do something here and then they built the shaniwar wada so that is where the example comes from but our forts are very functional so we need to be innovative and luckily now we have technology to be innovative so we can do audio tours of forts where we can imagine a kind of uh, thing to be you know going on we can tell the story via audio 
we can use holograms to tell stories each fort has multiple uh, stories we need good guides our guides are not uh, trained enough, trained enough. Uh, we need youngsters to get into the picture so hopefully you know, we see some action we, uh, ho- i i hope so another thing i would uh, like to uh, talk about is that when we say attention to preserving protecting and promoting these documents in some way for example i will give you an example that tomorrow if you if we have an exhibition say of chhatrapati shivaji's letters in nagpur and take a come and take a look at the text of the letters and we carry the original we carry a translation Super. in modern day marathi we also carry a translation in hindi and english Super. for the modern day youngsters so that they understand this so this is also our heritage i think we need to look at new ways of promoting heritage also bajira for example bajira 1 wrote 500 letters and there are 500 letters which are existing and they are in the peshwa daftar in pune now if we take them around the region even if we take copies of those letters because in india you never know anybody can steal anything <laughs> we have very high integrity so we can take copies and do a similar exercise i think there is tremendous curiosity now about maratha history people not only in maharashtra but across india have become very conscious about the fact that oh, oh no we have not been taught about maratha history at all we have not been taught enough about shivaji such an influential figure and the marathas ruled practically all of india but what have we been taught about nothing it's as if there were mughals and then there were the british as if this you know shivaji never happened and the marathas never happened and the 18th century never happened 100 years so history. that is the unfortunate part and that is why i am working on these subjects so bajirao wrote 500 letters nana saheb wrote even more letters than bajirao so all these documents are there there is a very fascinating figure in maratha history mahadev shingne now he is a he is the ambassador of the marathas in delhi for 25 years he acted as the envoy of the marathas in delhi and he played a very crucial role in this interlocution between the you know playing an interlocutory role with the delhi uh, mughal empire and the marathas and he has written plenty of letters back and forth so why can't we talk about these documents why can't we have a session at vlf about these documents why can't we take them everywhere so when we talk about heritage my argument now is that forts yes we must have ideas about forts but and like but the, we must have a broader idea agreed, also. agreed. yes uh, so we have completely run out of time over to you tasneem excellent igniting insightful conversation with with mr vaibhav purandare a huge round of applause please thank you thank you so much sir. the first run up event of vlf this session is now open to the audience you can raise your hands and ask questions to the author whoever wishes hello uh, thank you it was a wonderful session we had Uh, we've heard lot about uh, the financial uh, management of shivaji means everything is good about shivaji his valor his administration right but uh, i have overheard that he was not a good finance man- uh, manager means the uh, finances uh, he was always short of finances or he couldn't arrange finances and there was always a stress yeah as far as uh, the finance section is concerned and i think that is percolating even through generations because maharashtrians are always short of money <laughs> except so, for a certain uh, certain certain, uh, certain jagirdar and patel jagirdar <laughs> so, you you got the word yeah so so can you just clarify about that financial is there any thing nahi uh, when he, uh, shivaji raje bhosle is born in 1630 the deccan is ravaged by war and strife so already there is a lot of desolation and ruin the populace is completely ruined in the region and uh, when he starts building his state he is obviously completely short of resources hmm? but in his teenage years when he starts administering pune and the regions around pune he starts putting in place a revenue administration i have details of that administration in my book he offers various incentives for cultivation and for bringing wasteland into cultivation so he says that if you grow 10 trees then you know uh, the fruits of three you can keep 
and a certain percentage you have to give to the state. So I have given all of these. So he is extremely thoughtful in that respect. And he offers a lot of incentives. So if you kill so many wolves, for instance, the whole region is has been devastated by wolves. And even the human population has run away because wolves are, you know, rampant and, and they have ravaged the whole place. So he offers incentives if wolves are killed. To for he he encourages cultivation. And he sets norms. See, before he comes in, there are no norms. There are all everything is ad hoc. Now a Patil or a Deshmukh or a Jagirdar will tell you the rule is that on paper you should give the state 30% tax. But a Patil will come and take 80%. And where will you go, go, go and complain? Nowhere. A Deshmukh will take 70, 80%, 90%. Nowhere. But Chhatrapati Shivaji actually increases the percentage of tax that the state collects from people. If the state is collecting 30%, he takes 35% or 40%. But when it when he says 40%, he takes 40% only. And if somebody takes more, he punishes that official. So there is accountability that comes in. So he actually brings in some order into the revenue administration. And what happens is, when he is fighting his fight for liberation, for political liberation of his own people, there are constant attacks. See, Afzal Khan comes... He ruins a part of his state. Shaiste Khan comes and destroys everything in three years. He burns hundreds of villages. There is an account in my book and there are letters which talk about how entire villages were burned by Shaiste Khan. So for three years everything was destroyed in the region. That is why he goes and sacks Surat. He doesn't love sacking places. But he sacks Surat because you destroyed my people. I have to get their wealth back. The, the, the wealth of my state back, which is what he and he puts in place a, a system of administration which is further refined by his successors. And yes, he's always short of finances, that is because he's constantly fighting a war. And in terms of numbers, the Marathas are smaller than the Mughals, they are smaller than Bijapur. In terms of ammunition, see, he has to build a navy. Now, the Marathas have no technology to build a navy. Uh, we can talk about the navy a little bit if we have time. But so what does he do? There are letters from the Portuguese and the in British officials saying that Portuguese engineers have been hired by Shivaji. He calls Portuguese engineers and asks them to build the Maratha fleet. Now you have to pay the Portuguese engineers for that. And the Portuguese are themselves complaining that he is paying them more than we are paying them. That is why they are going to them. But he has that smartness to understand that you have to pay them more because I need to build a navy. My need is greater. I must give them that incentive. So he is a very smart person. Unfortunately, he is forever battling. See, he is fighting a great battle. And all his life he is fighting a battle. So he does his best and he struggles. He succeeds in many ways. But he is constantly facing setbacks. Actually, his career is remarkable because if you look at his career, it is one setback after the other, one setback after the other, and this man simply does not give up. I think, I think that's that's his, you know. Uh, thank, you. thank you, thank you. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Sachin, you have to. Yeah. Jagir Dars will decide who will ask. Uh, no, no. <laughs> uh, I am General Gadre. I am yes, from yes. the army. Yes. I am going to ask you a question about warfare. You know, uh, Shivaji has been named at number of places recently we were in Vietnam and yeah. they talk of Shivaji's guerrilla warfare techniques, huh. right? And he's the first guerrilla warrior uh, as, as read in the history. Yeah. Uh, the techniques that he, uh, uh, you know, championed, I would rather say, and he taught the uh, Maoras uh, how to fight in the mountains, in the mountainous region, hit and run away and, you know, uh, uh, not let the uh, enemy chase you thereafter. So, uh, is there any mention of uh, his warfare technique in your book? Absolutely, there is a lot of uh, mention as uh, uh, the Jagirdar here will attest to it, that there is a lot of, uh, there are details about uh, his warfare techniques and also since I mentioned the Navy about how he systematically went about building the Navy of, uh, you know, which was his own. Hello, sir. Hi. 
Uh, I have one controversial question uh, regarding uh, the death of Shivaji Maharaj. Uh, why I'm asking? Because you know, in certain uh, environment, a lot of discussions keep on happening. Kai asadhya rog, gurdhya rog, which is actually non-existent. Some says. Uh, it was some plan and he got killed by a certain community and all that hope. <coughs> so there is a difference between myth, reality and uh, as you call legend or whatever. So I think you are in a better position to throw light on this subject. <coughs> and, uh, let's. Uh, no, I will tell you what yeah. the evidence suggests. Yeah. <laughs> His health had completely broken down in, by 1680. Okay. Okay. There was, there, were, there was an internal family dispute, as we know, uh, because uh, the other queen wanted Raja Ram to take over. There was, of course, that uh, dispute. But uh, why am I saying that his health had broken down? When he, firstly, he's constantly on his horse and he's constantly uh, stressed out, you know, fighting one enemy against the and the other after the other. Then when he comes back from Agra, because he rides almost non-stop for one full month when he is returning from Agra. And it's a very tense situation. He comes back and he falls very ill in 1666 when he comes back in October, September, October. He falls very ill and for almost a month he is totally bedridden. So his health took a big beating at that time. And he recovered from that. A decade after that, in 1676, again his health broke down. And he had a major illness. Now, we, and then this, these are the things I am saying. It's very unfortunate we don't discuss. You know, and especially this is part of the, your, the answer to your first question also. Why Shivaji? Why now? I think in Maharashtra also, we, our conversation around Shivaji is very limited. You know, it's very superficial. Basically. So these two illnesses have to be taken into account when we look at his eventual passing away in 1680. So in 1676, he again suffers some major illness and his health is, is broken down completely and he has to rest for a long time. And in spite of that, he, you know, that southern campaign continues because, you know, he, you know, he wants to make peace with his uh, stepbrother, Venkoji and or Ekoji who is in the south and uh, all of that action happens. Uh, but the details from 1680 are very clear that he developed a very high fever. For eight days he had very high fever which would not uh, subside at all. And he was so debilitated, the, the weakness was, uh, it was so debilitating that the fever that he passed, passed away in April 1680. I do not think there is any truth to the conspiracy theories. Now see, there is uh, conspiracy theories will always exist, but I don't think there's any truth to those theories. Good evening. My question is, uh, where the Treaty of Purandar was probably one of the most traumatic uh, events in his life. Yes. And he was then, he went to Agra and in there he was imprisoned. So what must have kept his uh, people going when he was away for uh, unpredictable time and he was in the captivity, practical captivity of uh, Aurangzeb and they were, the future was uncertain. Their king was already surrendering 23 forts. He was accepting practically to everything what uh, Mizaraji Jai Singh was demanding. So what must have kept the state going in his absence? Actually, it's a fascinating question, very good question. I must uh, thank you for asking that question because uh, things were indeed uncertain because, uh, you know, and even when uh, Jai Singh came and 23 out of 35 forts were surrendered. So more than 60%, almost 70% of the forts, well, my maths is weak, but still almost more than 60% were surrendered by Shivaji Maharaj. I'm sure there were many people who were asking him, what are you doing? Why are you giving up the forts? Because if you give up 23 forts, it's all over. Now this is, uh, this again is an area where his remarkable personality and leadership comes through and his vision comes through because his what have we been taught in India and in Maharashtra Moden Pan Vakanar Nai right we have been taught like that right he said I will give up my forts but I will not break 
I will stay intact so I can win back those forts again. And he gives back those forts, of course with a heavy heart. He does not want to do that. But he, he is very good at assessing a situation. He understands the difficulty. He understands this is a life and death situation. He also understands it's going to be difficult to win back the forts. But it is not going to be impossible. But it is important to survive and live another day. And somehow he convinces the people around him that that is the right thing to do. And he gives up the forts. Now that is not a foresight that most rulers would have. Most rulers would say, oh my God, my pride is over. You know, how can I do that? I can't give up that. No, but he, he, he is not thinking like that. He is thinking long term all the time. So now again, this is another reason why I am saying that in Maharashtra, we have a superficial conversation around him. Now see, again, he is thinking very deeply about these things. He gives up the forts. Then he goes to Agra. Now Agra, of course, he does not want to go. He knows that he is going to be humiliated there. But the circumstances are such, he is under tremendous pressure, that he is under duress and he goes there. And the reason the outburst in Agra happens is also because exactly the thing he had expected has happened. So in a way he is cursing himself that why did I come here? I knew this would happen. And he comes here. So what you have asked is a very good question that how did people just keep going? I think that there was something in, the, in his leadership which kept them going because they knew that because of you know this thinking of his and f the kind of leadership he has shown from the age of 16 that so long as this man is around there is some hope and we need to keep things going uh, till he is back to ensure that he takes it forward and we can help to take, take him forward and they keep going because they see in the pers person of Chhatrapati Shivaji hope for themselves and for their families and a future for their families and for their society. I think Shivaji represents hope above everything else. You know, he represents hope against insurmountable difficulty. I think that is it. And at the same time, when he leaves for Agra, he is also aware that he may die there. So he also leaves behind a set of rules to follow in case he dies there. So this person should take over, this person should do this, this person, that's it, this is how the state should continue. And I have mentioned all of those things there. But just think of the possibility, if he had died there, it would have been all over and we would not have had the Maratha state. It is possible that Sambhaji would have taken over because he had extraordinary courage and bravery. But uh, it was important for Shivaji to have stuck around at least until 1630. He died at a very young age of 50 years. I think we need to tell the younger generation about all these things, about how he lived only for 50 years. You know, we only talk about what a great man he was. He just had a life of 50 years. Imagine him being around for say uh, 80 years. What would the man have done? Yes. Uh, good evening, sir. So evening. first of all, uh, my question is, it is fact that Shivaji Maharaj created everything from scratch. But I think there is a need to th throw the limelight on the stories of Sambhaji Maharaj because after Shivaji Maharaj, Sambhaji Maharaj extended the brown boundaries, the relation. He was a great scholar, and uh, I think there is uh, many. Uh, there are many consequences or conspiracies that says that uh, the history of Sambhaji Maharaj had been erased or uh, pretended mis uh, galti uh, galat uh, pretend kya hai. So what is the reason behind that? That abhi bhi hamare me Shia Sambhaji Maharaj ke liye itna aware nahi, awareness nahi hai. Ham unke baare me baat nahi karte hai. Nee, uska karan ek hai ki Maratha ke Maratha logo ke itihas ke baare me hi awareness nahi hai. To Sambhaji Maharaj ke baare me awareness kaise hoga? Shivaji Maharaj ke baare me awareness nahi hai. To Sambhaji Maharaj ke baare me kaise hoga? Ta, uh, to ham sab uske liye prayatna kar sakte hai, aur prayas kar sakte hai, aur prayas jari hai. And hopefully we will soon have a session on Sambhaji Maharaj and his bravery also. Hello sir. My question is that in our Shiva Charitra, we have a lot of people who are here. Like Bairuji Naik. Yes. We have a lot of people who are here. We have a lot of people who are here. Yes. But in fact, we have a lot of people who are here. Yes. We have a lot of people who are here. हाँ नहीं जैसा मैं मंडला दुर्दैवाने का है लेकिन मराठांचे अनेक डॉक्यूमेंट्स 
दे वर डिस्ट्रॉईड आणि अशी खूप कमी कागदपत्र आहेत ज्यामध्ये भैरजी नायकांचं नाव आहे पण एक असं कागदपत्र आहे ज्यामध्ये स्पष्टपणे म्हटलं आहे की बहिरजी नायकांनी त्यांना सुरतचा योग्य रस्ता कोणता आहे जाण्याचा तो दाखवला हे सोळाशे चौसष्टला जेव्हा शिवाजी महाराज सुरतला जातात तेव्हा क्लोजेस्ट रस्ता आणि द लिस्ट डिटेक्टेबल रस्ता कोणता आहे तो दाखवण्याचा का दाखवण्याचं काम हे बहिरजी नायकांनी केलं कारण कसं आहे ते जर काही भागातून गेले असते तर ते खूप जास्त प्रकाश झोतात आले असते आणि त्यांना ते सरप्राईज अटॅक करायचं होतं ते 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 जे एक सरप्राईज होतं ते ते झालं नसतं तर बहिरजी नायकांनी तो रस्ता दाखवला बहिरजी नायकांबद्दल अनेक आख्यायिका आहेत पण त्या आख्यायिकात मी जात नाही कारण तो आपला विषय नव्हे पण गुप्तहेरांची त्यांची व्यवस्था खूपच चांगली होती आणि पन्हाळगडाहून सु सुटतानाही म्हणजे गुप्तहेरांनी त्यांना खूप मदत केली कारण त्या ज्या कॅम्पमधली माहिती त्यांना पन्हाळगडावर मिळत होती त्याचा फार उपयोग त्यांना झाला निसटण्यासाठी वील हॅव टू क्लोज इट हिअर वायबब इज अवेलेबल फॉर सम मोर टाइम वी कॅन हॅव अन इन्फॉर्मल प्लीज सर वी हॅव सम अनाउन्समेंट टू मेक प्लीज प्लीज होल्ड ऑन फॅन्टॅस्टिक ऑडियन्स कीप रिडिंग कीप बाईंग थँक्यू रिडर्स for your articulate and precise questions i now invite vlf chair mr jitendra nayak to present a formal vote of thanks acha before before that i just want to thank sachin for such a wonderful session and i want to thank vlf for organizing this uh, and 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 persistent for this lovely auditorium and everybody here for being so patient while i've been going on and on Uh, and i was joking about the jagirdars they are a lovely family and a lovely people good evening ladies and gentlemen thank you very much for doing half my job <laughs> yeah. so um, a heartfelt gratitude and thanks to our uh, partners first of all would like to thank persistent um, for this beautiful auditorium and uh, you know for the arrangements here Uh, thank you to billboards thank you alag angle um uh thank you naivedyam crosswords um infocepts and uh, sms enviro care for being uh, our sponsors ad photography for doing such a wonderful job thank you helplink uh, charitable trust for always being there for us for the last uh, you know 3 4 years since we have been uh, with this uh, venture Okay, there it is. And uh, thank you, Saar Digital Films, for uh, being with us all through these uh, few years. Um, uh, I'd like to take this opportunity also to thank uh, the VLF 20 and VLF 23 teams, the core group, the action group, and volunteer group. Almost 50 members worked very hard over the last, you know, three four years. We had two beautiful, very nice VLF uh, uh, main events, and. Uh, um, today we are here because we are building this for forward and we have created a structure on this one now and um, <coughs> this is going to be more like a you know platform for the city of nagpur for vidarbha uh, to take it forward and it's really a citizens movement is what i would like to say um we can go to the uh, we would also like to thank our publishers uh, they are all here uh, it is through them that we are getting through to some of the uh, some beautiful authors who I like to talk to you about uh, soon uh, the the run ups which are upcoming yeah so um rashna bish uh, bish rawat um, has consented to uh do this uh, session on the 9th of december you'll all remember on 8th of december 2021 we lost our cds general bipin and um, in his memory and to dedicate uh, you know our uh, our our admiration for him we will have the session on the 9th of december not to be missed uh the next one would be on the 18th of november mr harish pat is a uh, is on the board of directors of tata group um he is very well known in the marketing he is almost heading the entire marketing of the tata group 
we have the good fortune he has uh, consented to be with us on the 18th of november we're going to do two of his books the tata stories which is a best seller and um, the office secrets is also a new book which has come out with so that will be on 18th of november rohan chakravarti is a cartoonist writer he hails from nagpur is a local boy and um, he's made a lot of waves works for the hindu and uh, his column is called the green humor so he'll be with us on the 14th of october and uh, the next one is a book which i think uh, will attract uh, people from all age groups this is shantanu naidu i think all of you have heard about him or uh, you know know about him he's a personal assistant to mr ratan tata he's going to talk to us about about his book called i came upon a lighthouse which chronicles his amusing journey on his uh, is wonderful chance to be assistant to personal assistant to mr ratan tata let me let let's let the video can you run the video let the radio video do the talking for uh, what's coming up next i'm sure all of us are going to be i mean excited to meet this young guy um yeah so uh, finally let me also tell you that we are opening registrations for this event it's on 30th september we are opening the registrations because we expect a more than full house on that day so that will start i think today today evening and uh, so finally thank you audience you make vlf happen you will keep it going and uh, we look forward to your patronage going forward any of you are interested in uh, you know helping blf uh, to volunteer to become patrons you can get in touch with me or sachin or any of our uh, you know uh, volunteers who are hanging around here yeah the contact details are right here so uh, come join this movement and uh, we would like to spread it across the city and make it really a citizens movement thank you very much I would now like to invite Jui Madhyeshwar from Alag Angle to come up on stage and present a token of appreciation to the author. The gift has a handmade painting that has been personalized for the author by Jui herself. Thank you, readers, for your hearty participation and thunderous applause. The author's books are available for sale and signing. 
MRP of this book is 799. Crossword provides a discount of rupees 150 and a discount from VLF as a gesture to promote buying and reading books is rupees 150. So the effective price for you, dear readers, is rupees 500 only. The author, Mr. Vaibhav Purandare, will be available for interaction after the session is over. Also, we have a competition coming up, which has two big ticket prizes. For that, I invite Muskan Chhabaria to reveal the event. Keep reading, keep buying. This is your anchor, Tasneem Akolawala, saying thank you for attending. Goodbye and see you at VLF's next event. Thank you, Tasneem. So we all make resolutions on 1st of January. I am sure you all have made for losing weight, traveling more, eating healthy food. And for readers, we all make a reading list also. And to be read, we buy more books and then they pile up and half a year has gone and we all know our status. So for that, we are coming up with a bingo challenge. Oh God. Wait. So for that, we are coming up with a reading bingo challenge where reading will be made fun. All you have to do is read books according to the challenge and click pictures. Share your pictures on social media so that we know you are participating in the cha challenge. The first winner will be awarded a gift voucher worth rupees 10,000 and the second a gift voucher of 5,000 from Crosswords with which you can buy more books to read. So it's a good. Registrations are uh, already open. You can scan outside. There is a QR code which you can scan and participate, register yourself. All the rules will be revealed on the social media. So sh be sure to follow us on our social media platforms. Here is the QR code for that. Thank you so much. Thank you for being a lovely audience. See you at the next event.